Kia ora koto, and welcome to this quick fire review of 16 reasonably obscure games. Now ideally I like to have games on these lists that have under a thousand owners on Board Game Geek. And when I prepared the video I thought all these games would and it turns out the first two actually have way more owners than I thought. But I've decided to keep them in anyway because they're not exactly Catan or Carcassonne. Now my normal process for reviewing games is to play them a bunch so that I can properly distill and summarize them in three minutes. Most of these games I've played once or twice, so these reviews are much more first impressions than my regular content. But that's the point of these videos, looking at some of the weird and wacky stuff that's out there that you might not have seen before. And the video will be done in descending order of owners on Board Game Geek. So to start us off with 3,180 owners, Red Outpost. Red Outpost is a worker placement game with a difference. The first is the theme, where various members of the Soviet Union have been sent to another planet to colonize it, using 1950s technology and thinking. But the real point of difference in this game is that it's a worker placement game where no one technically controls anything. Each of you takes turns moving a different worker to different spots in the colony, and then placing your influence marker on that worker. Some jobs workers like. For example, the farmer likes tilling the fields and no one else does. You principally gain points by increasing the mood of workers that you have influence on. And of course, if you're getting too much influence on someone, you're gonna get a good score off them, so other people can send those workers to do jobs they hate. Because it's only the player with the most influence on a character who scores them. Of course, bringing other players' scores down means you're not advancing your own, but some of the really negative actions give you really good rewards. There are six different workers, each with their own likes and dislikes. For example, the fisherman really likes fishing, and the commissar doesn't like to drink, but everyone else does. There's a dozen different worker spots on the board, so there's always plenty of options for what to do. Plus there's a resource and crystal collecting mini game as well. All up, Red Outpost is a really different take on the worker placement genre. And for that reason alone, I recommend checking it out if any of those ideas sound intriguing. My verdict for this one, keep and play more to see if I really like it. Game number two with 2,860 owners is Theseus the Dark Orbit. I've owned this one for nearly five years and still never managed to get a proper game of it in. I've set it up, I've learned the rules, and I've played multi-handed solo, but every time I've suggested to people that we play it, no one wants to give it a go. And the gist of the game is that it's an asymmetric Mansala movement game. And there's some really cool ideas in here, it's just really hard to explain to people why this would be fun. Each of the factions looks really different to play and has their own strategies and there's a lot of upgrades and power cards and different sort of tools and tricks each faction can employ. Overall I think this is an intriguing game but five years on the shelf of opportunity is just too long. So my final verdict is I sold this one to the local board game cafe so other people can enjoy it. Now to our first game that's got under a thousand owners on BGG and that is Dogs. Dogs is a game that mixes a lot of mechanics, uh, worker placement, set collection, and resource management. But the core idea of the game is that you own a dog rescue. And you drive around the board with your little truck picking up stray dogs and you try to treat the sick ones, you look after the stray ones, and then you return the owned ones back to their owners. And I've played this one a couple of times, and is it the best game ever made? Absolutely not. It's a perfectly acceptable, average sort of game. But it's the idea of the game that I really like here. And the idea of running a dog rescue is just, it's adorable. I can't think of many things more wholesome in terms of theme than a game like dogs. So while this one doesn't really light my fire, my verdict on this one is I'm gonna keep it because it's the kind of game I want to play with Anne when she's a little bit older. Up next with 864 owners is Shores of Tripoli. Shores of Tripoli is a two player car driven war game where the newly created United States of America takes on the Barbary Raiders. And this is a this is a gem of a game. I've given it a couple of solo plays and I'm really looking forward to playing it with a human opponent. But it does something that's really tricky and that's create an interesting two player war game that isn't loaded down with rules. This is an accessible war game. And the two sides are quite asymmetric. The Americans start slow, but they have way more resources. And their goal is to bludgeon the Barbary Raiders into stopping their raids. And they can do that by destroying their shipping, or by landing an army and taking out Tripoli. The Raiders on the other hand, they want to make money. So they're sending out raiding ships to gain coins. And if they get all of the coins, they win the game. So it's a race. The Raiders want to keep the Americans off balance as long as they can and keep making money. And the Americans just want to lock them down as soon as they can. And as a card-driven war game, 
you'll learn the history of the conflict by interacting with the cards and the simulation. Verdict, this one looks really, really good and I do want to play it against a live opponent. Definitely keeping it. Next up with 647 owners is Tetrarchia. This game is set in the period of the Tetrarchy, uh, at the end of the crisis of the third century, where Rome essentially had four emperors, each assigned a different region to govern and protect. And that manifests as your four player tokens that move around the board, representing your Tetrarch. Now, this game set in a period of great uncertainty and unrest for Rome, so it's all about quashing rebellions and stopping invasions. You really do not want the barbarian hordes sweeping in and sacking Rome. So the goal of the game is to place forces right along your borders so that the invaders can't get in. Which is easier said than done. Now if this game reminds you of Pandemic Fall of Rome, they have an awful lot in common. But oddly enough, Tetrarchia came out well before Pandemic Fall of Rome. And its gameplay loop is quite similar to that. You move a Tetrarch, then stuff happens. Barbarians attack or revolts take place. So it's a classic firefighting co-op. It also comes in a very small box. And that small box packs an awful lot of gameplay. This is a pretty good game. So my verdict for this one is I'm keeping it. It's going on the small box shelf and it's probably going to be a solo game experience for me, first and foremost. I'm not sure if it'd be a great game multiplayer, but as a solo game where you're playing all four Tetrarchs, a good time. Next up with 442 owners is Deep State. One of the games I played a lot in the 90s was Steve Jackson Games Illuminati and Deep State is in many ways a spiritual successor to that game because Illuminati has not aged well and there's a reason why my copy left my collection some time ago. In this game you represent a shadowy group trying to take control of different parts of the Deep State. You place your agents on different groups and the player with the most agents on that group at the end of the turn gets to claim them. Now, claiming these groups gives you symbols, and those symbols are used to advance yourself on the different world domination projects. There's also terrible missions you can send your agents on, and a whole bunch of different alliances and groups that you can ally with in order to boost yourself. There's a lot happening in Deep State, and the rules are a little bit convoluted in places. The gameplay's fine, it's definitely better than Illuminati, which as I said before has aged absolutely terribly. I only played this the once and the experience was okay. It's saving grace is this theme and all the different projects you can get involved with, all of the different crazy ideas about the different groups you're influencing. And you know, it's got reptilioids in it. So you know, that that's worth a laugh. But yeah, as I said, my first impressions are the gameplay is pretty average and it would be up to you whether the theme is compelling enough for you to investigate the game and see if the gameplay suits you. For me, my verdict is I might keep this one for a little while, see if any of my groups are interested in playing it. If not, it'll be on my get rid of shelf by the end of the year. Next up with 270 owners is Full Glory, the deck building game about gladiatorial conflicts. This game has a curious distinction. The first time I tried playing this with a friend, we got halfway through the game and they wanted to tap out. They, they were bored. They wanted nothing more to do with the game. And they were winning. So I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. If you don't want to play, you don't want to play. And I'm not going to force you to. So I tried another one of my dependable testers. These are people who will play just about anything. And the same thing happened. This is the only game that's ever been put on the table for three minute board games. where We've made two attempts with two different groups and they've both given up. And that's because we felt like the game was busy work. It's got the usual deck building stuff of, I've got a whole bunch of money cards, I'll buy these things, I'll put them in my deck. And you alternate doing that over and over and over until eventually you have one of the battles. And the battles are just such bloodless, lifeless affairs. They use like a whole page of rules to basically go, you go, then I go. Oh, but there's some interrupt stuff we can do. It's just dull. I'm sure if you are a massive, deck building fan and you like the idea of a head-to-head -head deck building game this could well be your jam but for me it was one of the most lifeless board game experiences i've had in recent memory is it a bad game probably not but it's a boring game and for me that's probably a bigger sin i'd rather play a game that's so bad i can laugh at it than a game i just want to stop playing because i'm bored verdict going on the get rid of shelf next up with 168 owners is world changers this is a small box game where players get dealt a small number of cards and there's a bunch of cards in the middle. 
the deck is quite small, so the game flies by reasonably quickly. And each turn you'll be interacting with one of these cards. And I'm going to put some of these up to show you what they do. A lot of them will create actions when you draft them and add them to your team, causing a spill on effect. Like the objective of the game is to have the most points in your tableau at the end of the game, but what's in your tableau dramatically changes based on what's drafted. There's also end game scoring ones where you actually want to go for a distinct strategy of maybe not having as many cards in your tableau and just trying to get high scoring ones. World Changes also takes probably less than half an hour to play and each of the different world changes has a unique ability and you're not going to see them each time so it's a quick fire drafting game where you're trying to build your tableau while screwing with other people's tableaus and there's lots of ways to do it good number of decision points crammed into a small amount of time verdict on this one is i'm keeping it and it's going on the small box shelf next up with 148 owners is enigma beyond code there are two things that define enigma beyond code for me the first is that the cards in the game are massive and they're really gorgeous like it, it actually looks really nice set up on the table normally you're supposed to set up in a three by three grid uh, but i set it up like this just for photographic purposes and the core gameplay loop is it's a deduction game you'll have an objective card that's given to you and each turn you'll get to peek at one of the cards you can then publicly declare what card that is and you don't have to tell the truth if no one calls you out on your lie or you are telling the truth you get to take the action of the card you've called out and handily, there's a reference sheet so you don't have to, you know, um and ah about what's on the card to decide whether you want to lie about something else. A false accusation of lying will mean the accuser loses their next turn. So you're sneaking peeks at these cards and recording down where they are in your little logbook because ultimately you want to complete that objective. So here our archivist would go, I'm going to reveal this card and these ones and win the game. And they'd know where those cards are located because they'd mark them down by sneaking, peeking and taking guesses based off what other people have said are at different locations so it's a fast fire deduction game my verdict on this one's kind of tricky because this just isn't the kind of game my groups are into like it's a good looking game the core cool gameplay loops fun but it's just not really our team's jam so it's a fine game with some cool ideas but it's going on the get rid of shelf next up with 106 owners is strike the Game of Workers' Rebellion. Strike is a pandemic-style firefighting co-op. The main difference in this one is instead of trying to defeat diseases, you're trying to stop corporate influence, and you're trying to mobilize strikers against this corporate dystopia. Each striker has different strengths and weaknesses based around the four different types of actions you can take. Now, corporate influence will keep piling up on the board, and that'll eventually manifest as one of these drones. Too many of those, you lose the game. And to win the game, you need to mobilize workers to strike. And each time you strike in a location, that gets progressively more difficult. There are a lot of ally cards from different groups of workers that you can use to support your actions. But fundamentally, this is a pandemic style game. And it's fine. Like the gameplay is absolutely acceptable. It doesn't light my fire like block by block does, but I still like the theme and the idea of it. And the one thing I really do like about it though, is the cards that are flipped over for the AI to represent the corporate actions. I don't think there's anything in any other game uh, that makes me hate the AI more than reading the card announcements each and every time you flip one over. Stuff like weekends, you're better off without them. And voting is a snooze fest. Corporate rule is cool and easy. I mean, it's about as subtle as a sledgehammer, but it does bring a smile to my face while I'm playing. All in all, Strike is a perfectly acceptable game in the mold of Pandemic. The only reason I'm keeping it is the theme and because I know entirely too many union people. And I think it's hilarious to play a game like this with people in the union movement. Next up with 97 owners is Limba 2. And this game shares a bit in common with Tetrarchia and Pandemic Fall of Rome, except this time it's Livonian Crusade and it's Estonia. And this one, your agents will move around the board trying to stop advancing armies by placing uprisings and fortifications in front of them. The different enemy armies advance based on a dice roll every time it gets to a certain point in the turn. And placing uprisings in their path dramatically slows them down. You can also fight their armies to push them back. There are some clever things in Limba 2 and it does play reasonably well, but the English translations of the rules have some ambiguities in them. So I've kind of had the house rule it a little. Which is not ideal, but that's what happens when you have translations from games made in different languages. Sometimes things get lost in the translation. My main issue with this one is it's another Fall of Rome, Tetrarchia, firefighting co-op against invaders. Like, I have plenty of games that do this. And I think I have some games that do it a little bit better. Verdict on this one, it's okay, 
but it's just a game space I have way too many games in already. So this one is going on the shelf to get rid of. Next up with 79 owners is Empyrean Hero, the card game. Now the long and short of this game is, there's a crap load of different heroes you can have on your team. You're trying to defend your sky base. You deploy different heroes, you boost them, and then you play cards and fight against each other. I mean, that sounds all well and good, but this is, this is not a great game. There are several things I would complain about with Imperium Hero. Uh, the first of which is, why does every stat in the game need to be a multiple of 10? Why do games do this? I know bigger numbers makes things sound more dramatic, but it's just, it's just stupid. Just from a design point of view, I don't see any reason to do it. And every conflict in the game just comes down to a little bit of math. I have more stuff, I beat you. The gameplay loop just isn't hugely fun. This is not a game I have any interest in playing again, and its verdict is it's definitely going on the shelf to get rid of. I can't really say much more about it, it's just a very mechanical game where each player totals up some math numbers and the highest number wins. That's not fun. Next up with 73 owners is Sidekick Saga. Now I have a confession to make with this review. I played the first mission of Sidekick Saga about a year ago, and I remember it being quite complex, but reasonably entertaining. And this game is clearly a labor of love from the designers. It's a six part campaign with a whole bunch of narrative and story elements built in. And if you've played a game like Pandemic Legacy, it's organized in that way. So each time you get to a new story, new cards and new content comes out. And the core gameplay is moving around different locations, investigating them, and trying to get to the bottom of the criminal conspiracy that's going on. My really big confession with this though is when we moved house, the box of Sidekick Saga came open and all the cards came out. And I have no idea how to put the game back together. All those cards are lovingly organized into different stacks that you pull out based on how far you are through the campaign. And for me, they're just a giant mess right now. This meant looking back at the game, I had to rely on my memory from quite a while ago, which is pretty damned hazy. What I can say is if you are into superheroes and you don't just want to do the Marvel DC thing like everyone else, and you want to check out a different style of superhero game, have a deeper look at Psychic Saga. A lot of work has gone into it. I wish I could give you a much more informed opinion on this one, but really all I can say is that I remember it being reasonably good, that it's clearly a passion project that a lot of work's gone into, and it's refreshing to see something other than Marvel and DC in this genre, which is one of the reasons I like Sentinels of the Multiverse. Verdict on this one, I don't know if I have the energy to reassemble it. I'm probably going to gift this to someone who really wants to give it a crack. Only three games to go. And next one with 45 owners is Pizza Delivery. Now, Pizza Delivery does what it says on the tin. It's a game about running a pizza delivery place. There are a pile of different orders for you to complete around the board that are demanding different pizzas and take different amounts of time and energy to get to them. And to deliver the pizza, you need different transport vehicles, you need bags for your pizza, and of course, you need the pizzas. But there are two things that truly boggle me with pizza delivery. First of all, is it's way too over-engineered for what it is. Here we have the order cards and the trackers. Uh, completing these orders will take time and energy and generate you money. And you track time, energy, and money on three different tracks. The game ends once time runs out, but you also need to like, take a nap if you've used too much energy, which uses up time. It's a very micro manage game. The second, very trivial thing, but very important to me, is these pizzas look disgusting. I think I'd eat the red one, but there's no way I would touch any of the others. All in all, pizza delivery is trying to do too much for what it is. And in doing that, it becomes an accounting problem. And that's not necessarily an interesting puzzle to solve. My verdict for this one, it's getting out of here. Second to last game with 42 owners is Rugby the Game. Rugby the Game is a locally made one, and it's a fascinating thing. It's what I call a simulationist experience. That is, it really tries to depict a game of rugby. From the kickoffs to the rucks, the malls, all of the player interaction, that happens in Rugby the Game. And each of the players in your team has a lot of different stats that are rolled for a bunch of different actions. There's also a lot of tactics cards you can use to influence the course of play. But to give you an idea of how the game works, here are the kickoff rules. And you'll see that the kickoff rules are quite long and in fact the rules for this game in general are quite long it's a very detailed simulation experience now i used to play rugby i played rugby for many many years but i'm not really into the sport anymore it's not really my jam and i think to really like rugby the game you need to be into rugby this needs to be a sport that you're really passionate about 
and if you are rugby the game is a great fit it is very deep and very detailed and clearly the people who made this game absolutely love rugby but i don't think i'd recommend it to anyone out there who isn't a rugby fan like i don't think i can recommend the game solely on its gameplay you have to be wanting to experience the game of rugby as a board game to really appreciate this one so my verdict on this one is a great game for rugby fanatics i'm not a rugby fanatic so i'm passing this one on and last but certainly not least with 14 owners on board game geek baby dragon's bedtime and i love that the last game is actually one i'm going to talk about quite favorably so in baby dragon's bedtime you throw a whole bunch of cards into the middle of the table and you have a starting deck with five cards on it these allow you to peek at cards on the table flip cards over or take them into your discard pile so in a way it's a deck building game we are going to be going through the pile looking for stuff that you want to add to your treasure trove you don't want to get dust bunnies for example because they're worth negative victory points really you want to be going after the gold and the hoard cards that are worth victory points and that seems quite you know normal mundane kind of deck building game but here's the twist this is a real-time game you are flipping over your cards from your deck and taking the actions at the same time as everyone else and then reshuffling your deck when it's done it's batshit and it's over really really quickly this is a ludicrous game for ludicrous people but oh my goodness will there be a bunch of kids out there who will find this a hoot and even adult gamers will find this a crack up as a filler game because it's so fast and so silly and you know just when you think you've seen everything in a genre like deck building someone goes how about real time deck building let's see how that works and you know what there's only 14 owners of this game on board game geek and i hope they appreciate what a silly little thing they've got there and how much fun they potentially have at their fingertips verdict on this one and definitely keeping this and adding it to the small box games collection so that's the end of the list but one more thing to note and that is that i will be revisiting at least one of these games for a proper three minute recap in the future what game will that be well that will be decided on patreon so if you want to get involved in three minute board games content and help steer the ship and decide what games we cover pop along to patreon it also helps keep three minute board games independent and lets me do these drive-by reviews of all these wacky games and if you enjoyed this video like share hit the notification button and subscribe to the channel